This is the old River Lee flowing along the east side of Hackney Marshes, part of a huge wildlife corridor coming into London from Hertfordshire and Essex. The habitat here is so important locally. There's a good few species that you won't find anywhere else in Hackney. But multiple factors have taken their toll on this habitat, leading to a reduction in biodiversity. In the last 20, 25 years, we've lost so many species in this area. There's a few kinds of birds that are no longer seen, Amphibians like smooth newts and common toads used to be found in this woodland area. Slow worms were found over the river there and there was once a healthy common lizard population about two miles to the south, all now gone. About 25 years ago the area around that pylon there was fenced off and that was home to a good number of rabbits. Not only did they manage the grassland effectively but they created a unique bit of habitat. Because this whole site is built on bomb rubble, you can't dig very deep, so their burrows were prone to collapse. And those collapsed burrows were used by a couple of species of rove beetle, solitary bees, and pygmy shrews. When the fence around the pylons came down, it took less than six months for the rabbits to disappear. And that was also the last time pygmy shrews were seen here. It's small mammals that have suffered the most due to changes in this area. Common shrew numbers have fallen, and short-tailed voles were absent from this site for over 20 years. If you visited these woods in the early 2000s and knew where to look, it would take no time at all to find wood mice. There were so many. But numbers of this species have dropped drastically since then. And there's a few reasons why. With an increasing number of houseboats on the Riverlee navigation just over there, there's a much greater demand for firewood. So logs are removed from this area on a daily basis. And when logs are removed, habitat is destroyed. There's also been a massive increase in dog ownership over the past few years. Of course, this is a great place to exercise dogs. There's hundreds of them passing through every day. It's not uncommon to see someone walking 10, 12 dogs on their own, not paying attention while the dogs are running off through the woods here. We're also noticing an increase in cat sightings. And of course, dogs and cats will take their toll on small mammals. And the whole so-called Hackney Beach craze hasn't helped, which has sadly been promoted by a couple of newspaper articles. Every summer, so many people gather on the banks of the old River Lee, swimming in one of the most polluted rivers in the country, partying, playing loud music, burning logs, which obviously has a massive impact on wildlife. There hadn't been any kind of mammal survey in this area for years. So in 2020, I decided to try and find wood mice or signs of them. I spent five days manually searching this whole mile long stretch of woodland and I backed that up with camera traps. No hits on any of the camera traps. One of them got stolen, which is no great surprise. In fact, the only evidence that I found of wood mice were a couple of food caches right at the southern tip of this woodland area. The loss of wood mice had a devastating effect on the local ecosystem. There's a good few weasels here. I suspect that 75% of their prey would have been wood mice. Without them, they needed to look for another food source. They moved over to the other side of the river where there's more grassland and took a toll on the vole and shrew population there, which meant kestrels left. It's a classic example of how if you take one crucial species out of the local ecosystem, everything falls apart. Fortunately, when Hackney Council were made aware of the situation, we managed to get a plan in place very quickly and started building these protected log piles throughout the whole wooded area. The structure of these log piles varies. All are great for wood mice, but we also build with many other species in mind Obviously there's lots of cavities underneath these which give them somewhere to hide. They're fenced off so people can't steal the logs and they're protected from dogs. Initially we were joined by staff from Hackney Council and a good bunch of other volunteers have helped out over the course of this project. It was an all hands on deck approach at the start. We needed to get as many of these refuges in as quickly as possible. Save Lee Marshes helped us out. 
wildlife gardeners of Haggerston and Russell from Renature London joined us from the very first day. I was concerned at first that we wouldn't be able to build habitat quick enough. But that changed when Gideon of Wildlife Gardeners of Haggerston managed to secure funding for the Old Riverley Restoration Project. And that extra funding meant we could really step up what we were doing. The Old Riverley Restoration Project has got a number of strands to it. We've been very lucky to have been supported by the Mayor of London to deliver Hackney's Nature Recovery Plan. The application was for one year but reapplying twice allowed work over three years. Hackney Council and the Environment Agency gave us match funding and the Wild Trout Trust also supported us. Getting to know a site over time and seeing what works well in a particular place is really helpful. We've been planting up native plants within the river and devising techniques that will encourage those plants to establish and then colonise. In addition to the interventions in the river, we also cleared invasive species along the bank, then replanted the banks with native species like alder, pendulous sedge and hawthorn. Something else that's been really exciting has been increasing the complexity of flow and you can see that here where we've been pushing trees into the water and securing them. Then instead of the flow being very steady, you've got some parts that are going faster. So where the water goes fast, you're removing sediment and where the water is slowing down, you're getting deposition. That creates different biological niches. You've got greater biological potential and that greater biological potential allows for increased biodiversity. As well as doing this work within the river, on the banks and higher up in the woodland around the river, we've been increasing the complexity of habitat for small mammals. It's been just over three years since we started building loggeries and we've built so many in that time. We've also used artificial food caches to encourage the mice to move into and repopulate the areas where they used to be found. In the final year of the project we've been really lucky to have Russell Miller leading coppicing workshops. Through the coppicing we're allowing more light in and this gives the opportunity for more species to thrive. If we coppice, we can keep different structure, different levels, and we maintain the diversity of the woody species. Let the saw do the work. The wood that's cut down is put into these dead hedges. Not only does the wood decay, which means that fungi, bacteria, beetles, and other insects have all got food, but in addition to that, it's also shelter. So it's shelter for small mammals, amphibians. They then feed other things higher in the food train. So you start with things like fungi, the beetles will move in as the fungi starts to decay the wood, the beetle larvae, and the adult beetles will then feed things like shrews and hedgehogs. So you get a whole food chain associated with the decaying wood. In addition to the dead hedges, we specifically build other habitat, particularly things like shelters for hedgehogs, for wood mice, so they've got somewhere to hide, somewhere to breed, but also just somewhere to get away from all the dogs on the marshes so that there's a little bit of safe space. It's been really great to help on the coppicing workshops this year. It's so nice to see so many volunteers come and join us and help creating more habitat in the woodland. One, two, three. This is part of a really quite big project which has been going for the last three years, restoring habitat right across Hackney Marshes. Good. There was the North Marsh Habitats project which we ran in 2023 which concentrated on North Marsh where we put in copses and low nutrient substrate habitat around the Hackney Marshes Pavilion. We've come together to work on all the loggeries and these dead wood habitats, all these high vernacular. We're restoring all the areas of woodland around the Hackney Marshes. We've planted new areas of woodland so it's a landscape scale broad project to restore the entire ecosystem. In the last few months of the Old Riverley Restoration Project, we added large protected habitat areas to the meadow around the pond. Previously, as part of the North Marsh Habitats Project, we'd built refuges with the reintroduction of several species in mind. One of the mammals we focused on was the short-tailed or field vole. This is a common species found in a few nearby sites, but absent from Hackney Marshes since the early 2000s. The long-term plan was to reintroduce them, but changes in the neighbouring Middlesex filter beds in 2024 
sent some of the resident population from that reserve our way as work began to return some parts of that site to wetland. When machinery started digging out these filter beds, that caused small mammals on this site to leave. And just a few metres away through this hedgerow is the grassland of the North Marsh, where we've built so much habitat, making it perfect for short-tailed voles to return. And that's exactly what they did. When copses and uncut grass areas were created in the North Marsh Habitats project, it took just a couple of months for common shrews to populate a site that had previously been nothing more than mown grass. This, combined with increasing signs of wood mice in the woodland area, and voles returning to the meadow for the first time in over two decades, made it apparent that we needed a small mammal survey. I was asked to do this survey by the wildlife gardeners of Haggerston. We wanted to look at whether the large numbers of refugia were working as a conservation tool. So we looked at these areas and we got three trap sites. The first one was predominantly grassland, although there was a fair amount of scrub there as well. And that's where the pond had been put in. The second one was riparian habitat and our traps were protected by dead hedges. The third one was a woodland area. Our survey took place in September 2024. Over a three-day period, traps were loaded with seeds and apples to attract voles and mice, and flycasters for shrews. They were also stuffed with hay to keep animals warm. Traps were set in the late afternoon and evening, and then checked in the early morning. We put out 40 traps. One in there, one under there. We got 64 mammals. 52 of those were wood mice. There we go. Hello, wood mouse. Seven short tailed voles, which is a very nice surprise. A tiny little thing. That's your first official record here in over 20 years. This is a long with trap, an incredibly versatile tool, very easy to put together. We also use Sherman traps as well as Longworth traps in the riparian zone. So this is a Sherman trap. These operate slightly differently from the Longworth traps. We're actually looking at evidence. So evidence is just as important as finding a live animal in the trap. The first thing we want to see is whether the food has been eaten, whether the castors have been eaten or whether the sunflower seeds have been eaten because that will tell us the type of animal that has eaten them, whether it's a shrew or a wood mouse. But we've also got a lot of poo in here as well, so small poo suggests a shrew. Ian had seen a shrew train, so that's taking the data at its highest, actually seeing proof of breeding. The small mammals ever, it was amazing. It was thrilling to see just how well these species had recovered. Another trap that has been tripped suspect this will be another wood mouse which is boring but fantastic because that was the whole aim of this project it's been absolutely excellent we've had voles we've had shrew evidence in all habitats grassland riparian and woodland we've had an absolute abundance of wood mice it's been brilliant we've seen the kestrel on the pavilion and obviously it's there because the wood mouse population has recovered this is where you were that was saying and this is where you go free. It's very interesting that short-tailed voles were using the habitat that's been created that weren't traditionally what we expect short-tailed voles to be using in tussock grassland. They're actually using the refugia, making their runs in the refugia. You're a lump. One of the things we really need to do is to make those areas of tussock grassland bigger especially in the winter because as the grasses die back there's less and less food for them so we know that they're using the habitat that's been created but they need to come out into the grassland to forage and that's when they're vulnerable so we need to make those areas bigger expand the tussock grassland it's not just about the small mammals themselves it's about the complexity of the food chain that they are just a part of the project's already seen a lot of successes. We've got kestrels back, and that's because the kestrels are feeding on the small mammals. And because of that, we've also got weasels. The whole ecosystem, particularly for the small mammals, is really benefiting. In addition to the habitats that we've created, we're also imagining habitats that have been created before. 
on North Marsh, there's the North Marsh Meadow, which is an area of long grass, which has got quite a good wild flower mix in it. That had been left for several years. So we've worked with the council to get that cut and we're working to optimize that for flora, but also for the small mammals which have moved in. And that involves a combination of cutting at the right time, but also protecting the small mammals during the cut. So some of the time we spend relocating the small mammals so they don't all get predated. Obviously cutting so soon after voles had returned to the site wasn't ideal, but by doing it with a smaller mower and having a team of people ready to scare off crows and relocate small mammals, we were fairly successful in limiting losses. You're quite spooked aren't you unfortunately? Are you injured? No, you're just chilling, wondering where your home's gone. This area does have to be cut, otherwise it would turn to scrub and be less suitable for the small mammals and also result in the loss of plant species. All animals caught were relocated into the refuge areas that we've built. Yes, this will cause some territorial squabbles, particularly amongst the shrews, but that's way better than leaving them out in the open to be picked off by crows. Unfortunately, we did lose a few animals to crows and dogs, and we let the kestrel take one. Everybody stay still, so he comes in. This is because kestrels have only recently returned to the North Marsh, and we want to give them as much help as we can. Whereas there's an established population of crows, in fact, there's probably more than there would naturally be due to the amount of people that feed them. We're also installing kestrel nest boxes, so hopefully we'll see a breeding pair soon. Being here as the grass is cut gives us an even greater insight into how well both common shrew and short-tailed vole populations are doing in the area. And we hope to secure more funding soon so we can continue to build on what we've already accomplished. It's very satisfying to see that we're having an impact, that all this effort over the past few years has made a big change. After three years of hard work, it's just so rewarding to see all of these species returning to the marshes. It's fantastic to have positive results so quickly. You see the benefit of the work you've done. There's no feeling like it, it's, it's the best thing. Seeing the results of the small mammal survey and what we found when we started the grassland management was so satisfying. I knew we'd get results, but what we achieved exceeded all expectations. Thank you.